Welcome everybody to the 2021 NCPH plenary. We're so glad you can join us for this very special session with NCPH president Greg Smoke and Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation council member and formal tribal, tribal chairman, Darren Perry. I've known Greg for a while now as both a mentor and a friend. We've been on panels together. He's been my editor for an essay in his latest anthology on public history in the American West, for example. And I've even enjoyed drinks in his backyard. <laughs> we have yet to ski together, but there's still time, even this winter. I've always admired and appreciated Greg's commitment to the profession and to doing public history and facilitating the work of younger scholars, which has impacted so many lives, including my own. Similarly, Darren Perry's work as a scholar and a historian, as a public servant and as a tribal leader has also significantly impacted the lives of those around him. His book and his efforts to reclaim the site of the Bear River Massacre are exemplars of what Lori Arnold and I, as co-chairs of this conference, hope to highlight with each telling and retelling of stories about who we are and who we have been, we reinforce our relationships to each other and to the land, bridging between the past and the present, the places we are and the places we have been. But it matters how we tell these stories. It matters that we look for and elevate the stories of those whose voices have been forgotten. We hope that you enjoy this conversation and find it inspirational for continuing your own work. Many thanks to the American West Center at the University of Utah for sponsoring this conversation and making this plenary possible. And with that, let me turn it over to Greg Smoke. Well, th thank you, Lisa. Thank you for the very, very kind words and kind introduction. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome everyone to this um, second and final public plenary um, for NCPH 2021. I wanna begin by acknowledging that I'm speaking to you from Salt Lake City, Utah which is located on the, um, the ancestral lands, the indigenous lands of, of the Shoshone, the Ute, the Goshu, the Paiute people of, of Utah. And I wanna recognize um, both their, their um, lives and history here as well as their, their um, present here, their current um, state of sovereign nations here in um, the state of Utah. Also just Briefly, I want to send out a thanks to a very, very hardworking NCPH staff. This has been quite the undertaking for the last um, several weeks. Um, going online offered some great advantage, but it also meant a great deal of work for Executive Director Stephanie Rao, for Megan Hillman, for um, Stasia Tanzer, and for Hannah Smith. And they are, um, they are an exceptional staff. I also want to thank um, the good folks of Hutchison Design Group who handled the complex technical aspects of this conference and handled it um, so well. Um, when we conceived of the program for this meeting, which was scheduled to take place here in um, Salt Lake City, um, I really wanted to highlight you know, the public history work that goes on in Utah and goes on in the American West and that meant, I think first and foremost, a distinct focus on indigenous public history. Um, I've been engaged in work with native peoples for several decades now. And you know, with the meeting coming to Salt Lake, um, I instantly thought of you know, Darren Perry and, and the Northwest Band Shoshone, the Northwestern Band Shoshone Nation, the, the efforts there of, of a tribal nation to um, control their own history, you know, to, to interpret it, to preserve it, a real grassroots effort that I think is um, phenomenal. And I wanted it to be something we talked about at this meeting. We had, of course, planned on a field trip, um, one of our, our trips, our, um, our tours to, to go to um, the Bear River Massacre site. Um, so while we weren't able to do it this year, NCPH will be coming back to Salt Lake City in, um, 2024, and I anticipate you will get to meet Darren in person there, and um, we'll go up there for, for I think will be a, one of the most memorable and important um, trips that we have. Um, so let's jump into this. And what I want to do is, you know, again, frame this with the idea, the conference theme of the persistence and pre the presence and persistence of stories, and and storytelling, simply put, has been 
the traditional means for native peoples to preserve and to pass down their histories. And um, what we wanna talk about today is a family history of storytelling, but also the modern um, manifestation of that, the way that this is being um, used today in, in the modern world to continue that preservation and to tell that story in, in new ways. So welcome, Darren, and I'll, I'll let you perhaps um, introduce yourself and then we'll jump into this conversation. Sounds good, Greg, thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. I wish it was in person. Uh, I really miss the being able to have that interaction and the handshakes and the hugs. And so uh, I'm honored to be here. I, I serve as a councilman for the Northwestern Band of Shoshone Nation. I stepped down as chairman to run for Congress uh, this last election cycle. And so uh, I'm just honored to serve as chairman and be a voice for our people who have seldom had a voice. So thanks for having me. All right. Well, you know, I wanna begin with family history because, you know, a topic that is, is so dear to you and certainly is, is that you discuss fully in, in, in your book is your grandmother, Mae Timimbo Perry, and how she essentially was for decades the, a, a tribal historian and, and worked to preserve um, tribal history. And so I'll just throw it open to you to talk a little bit you know, about her and about family stories, since maybe some of your cherished family stories and how, how that storytelling was passed down through your family. And I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now because we have some pictures here that um, you go ahead and start and I'll share my screen. Sounds um, good. So I'm, yeah, I'm, as I'm not as technically adept perhaps, but I will, <laughs> I'll get us there eventually. I have no doubt, my friend, no doubt. So uh, before I begin, I, wa I want you to know, and I always use this quote because it speaks to me and the way I learned. And uh, it says that people will always forget facts and figures about history but they will never forget how they felt when they hear a story. And so, you know, I was very fortunate enough in my lifetime to have my parents both work. And so I, I don't know if every child could say that, but, and, and the reason being, they dropped me off at my grandmother's house every day. And so I remember walking up to that door, finally being old enough to open it by myself and, and walking in down this small corridor but I remember the smell, the smell of smoked buckskin would be the first thing that greeted me as I entered her home, this old wooden home. And then the first turn was the kitchen and there she would be sitting at the end of a kitchen table with a, a pile of brilliantly colored beads in front of her with uh, buckskin uh, surrounding. And so those were always every day of my childhood, the first thing that I would be greeted to. You know, she would, she would sit for hours and she'd tell me these stories about how you would become a chief. She'd tell me stories about the greedy porcupine or the story of the choke cherry. And not only would she tell me those stories, I got to live those stories as well. Uh, because of her, I developed this great love for history. And so uh, it was there in her home that I met Brigham Madsen. I was, I'm not sure how old I was, but he just seemed like he was 10 foot tall to me. And, and it, and day didn't go by that there wasn't a knock on the door and, and some historian or grad student or a journalist seeking the perfect story uh, would be at her, be at her door. And she would always uh, allow them to enter. And uh, it was there I started hearing the story about the massacre of Bear River, because that's what most people wanted to talk about when she went there. I always remember, though, too, a pot of stove, be a pot of stew on the stove uh, every day with fresh homemade bread. And uh, I didn't think much about that until years later. And then I finally got the courage to ask her, 
about that stew being there every day. And, and it was then that she taught me a really beautiful lesson. She taught me that, uh, she said, in our culture, you never have someone come in your home without feeding them. And, and that was a beautiful concept to me. And, and I've thought about that a lot over the years. You see, Native Americans didn't have any concept of personal property. And she would always tell me that our, our communities are only as strong as our most vulnerable. And I can imagine living a hunter-gathering lifestyle that um, those people were never more than a few days away from starvation. So having a pot of stew on the stove and, and making those guests eat, whether they wanted to or not, uh, was something that was really instilled in her as a young child by her grandfather, who was a survivor of the massacre. And so those impressions uh, became so important to me. You know, but I, I thought about my grandmother a lot, and I think about her every day. She was our tribal historian. She was the keeper of the sacred records. And it was her job to pass down these stories that have been told for centuries. You know, tribal elders would sit down with the young children and tell them stories about uh, things that they needed to know. I had somebody ask me the other day, well, as they lived this hunter-gatherer lifestyle, when did they have time for education? And I, I told them this, I said, winter was always the elders time to tell these stories, to pass down their wisdom and knowledge and tradition and pass down language. And it was here that the children could sit. The hunting and gathering was over. Uh, you could sit and enjoy family relationships in those lodges over the winter. And you really didn't have much to worry about other than enjoying time with family. And that was always the key thing. Because of her and this great love for history that I developed, you know, I went to school and I was so proud of my heritage. And I remember sitting in high school class one day and the teacher said, we were going to talk about the five indigenous tribes in Utah. And uh, we'll talk about the Shoshones on Monday. And, you know, I had a sense of pride that my, my peers were finally going to hear about uh, people that I've heard about for my whole life. And, and Monday came and the teacher started talking about the Shoshone people. And, and I sat there thinking, well, that's none of the stories that I'd heard from my grandmother. Where is she getting this information? Because I didn't recognize any of it, but it was supposed to be about my people. And I think I come to realize at that time, in that place, that uh, the quote that was attributed to Winston Churchill when he said that history is only written by the victors it became very apparent to me that day at Clearfield High School in 1976 that uh, Native American perspectives and Native American histories have never been written. And so because of this wonderful woman, May Timbimbu Perry, uh, we have a, a really a vibrant cultural history today because of her only because of her almost. So, you know, she was a product of the boarding school systems. And so she, she, she lived through that, but she came home and went to Bear River High School and she uh, got educated. And then she got her uh, English degree at LDS Business College. And then she did something that literally has changed the trajectory of our tribe. And she began writing down the stories uh, that she'd heard her whole life. And so, you know, Greg, that's really the beginning of, of the, the tribal history that we have today is because of her, uh, her foresightedness enough to be able to see that things were changing in this world. And it was important to her that if she didn't write it down, a lot of it was probably going to be lost. Yeah. Now, did you, when you sat next to her as a child and heard these stories on a daily basis, was there any sense, did you have a sense that she was preparing you to do what you have done today and for the last many years? It's essentially kind of taking on this mantle of being a tribal story, along with your, your, your cousin, Patty Timibu Madsen, who's also a 
very important figure in preserving this history. Um, but when did you realize, boy, I, I'm actually being prepared to take on this role as an historian? You know, I, I wish I could say it was then, but I'm sure it wasn't. Uh, you know, as a young child, you're just soaking up these these stories about, uh, you know, the coyotes and and this the stink bug and and so how, the bald eagle and you know they they just became so real to me, and, but it, it wasn't until later in life, uh, much later in fact, uh, probably into my 40s that I started to realize as I watched my father, who was the director of Indian Affairs for the state of Utah, uh, talk about tribal history and knowledge. And, and all of a sudden, it, it became real again to me that uh, the things that my grandmother taught me were deeply ingrained. They were there. I, I just hadn't realized my responsibility. And, and maybe it wasn't my responsibility yet. Uh, mm -hmm. My father was doing that work then. But I remember one thing she did say to me one time when I was younger, and she said, she said, Darren, no one has ever wanted to hear our story before. And she said, one day you will have to make them listen. And you know what? I, I remembered that, and I'm not sure why I remembered it. But uh, as I've gotten older, I've really come to realize what she meant by that. And uh, she'd worked her whole life to, to write it down and to get it out there as much as possible, but um, no one ever wanted to listen, really, other than the historians. Mm -hmm. But for the general population in general, nobody ever wanted to hear it. And so, but times change. And, it, and I'm glad to say that I think the generations today are, are really wanting to hear. And as I go around and talk about some of these issues, the audiences are eager and more than willing to uh, listen to the things that we have to say and, and listen to the perspective that we want to share. You know, we as Native Americans aren't looking to have things made right. Uh, we just feel like those who died at Bear River and those of our people that have passed, their stories, they have a God-given right to be heard. Their voices speak to me from the dust. And so it's it's really important in a society of of uh, equality and, and social justice that we give people a voice that have never had a voice yeah and so um that's part of the work uh, she did and it's part of the work i'm trying to carry on to continue her legacy really well let's turn towards that story of of bear river which is one of the most horrific stories in American Western history, certainly. Um, I'm gonna advance a few slides and you tell me which ones you know to talk about. I'm gonna just briefly give some folks some context as we look at this slide here, which is a photo taken of the Valley of the Bear River. This is near Preston, Idaho, about four miles north of Preston. And it was on this site on January 29th, 1863, that a a village of um, Northwestern Shoshones, of Shoshone people was, was attacked by um, volunteer troops of the United States Army. Um, that's January 29th, 1863. They attacked the village from pretty much the angle that we're looking at. And at the time, and I think maybe my cursor is visible, I'm not sure if it is, the village would be situated right here, right? And then down over here, just for future reference, oops, let me go back. Oh, I am over here is where the monuments, the older monuments we're going to talk about are. In any case, um, this attack took place after rising tensions between Native peoples and the, the Mormon settlers in the Cache Valley, but also between uh, miners going back and forth between the Montana mines. Um, it took place um, at dawn on a brutally cold morning um, and resulted in um, the largest mass murder really in, in the history of the American West. It's documented. Um, most Americans throughout their education sometimes encounter perhaps the Sand Creek Massacre or of course Wounded Knee, but they rarely ever hear about um, 
Bear River. And for generations, obviously, historians look to the historical documents that were produced by people like Patrick Edward Connor, who commanded the troops that day, his official report, also some of the letters by um, nearby um, Mormon settlers, people like Peter Mon, who, while they decried the brutality of the massacre, also shifted the blame for it onto the Shoshone people for not accepting the gifts of civilization as they might, as they should have, perhaps. Um, and so that was that was the interpretation for for many many years. And it, I don't want to simplify it um, down to a single word, but it really it, it comes down to this idea of this this incident as being a battle, not a massacre. And it's been a long struggle to shift that one word and to shift the interpretation of this place and that event and to make people really come to grips, to bring accountability um, to this. And so Darren, maybe could you tell us how essentially Shoshone people told this story and I could back up to the picture of Sagwitch if you want, if that's a good place sure. to start. Yeah, do, do that. Let's talk about Sagwitch and then towards the end, we'll talk about those monuments and what they mean uh, going forward. But uh, this is a picture of Chief Sagwitch and his fifth wife, Biwo Chief. Sagwitch was one of the chiefs of the Northwestern Band. He was my great, great, great grandfather. I'm a direct descendant. And so uh, just real briefly, let me give you some context of that, what happened that morning. Sagwitch, uh, my grandmother would take me to the spot every year and we'd sit down on the ledge on the bluff and uh, she'd tell me the story about Sagwitch being an early riser and he, he got up as usual on the morning of January 29th to survey the area as he'd always done. And he could uh, see a steaming mist on the bluff of the picture you just showed at Connor's Overlook that's on the other side of the valley. And, uh, when you look at that picture you just posted, it looks like an easy, you know, meandering down to the river and it is, but if you're on the other side of the valley looking over there, it looks like it's a steep drop off. That was the only place that Connor could have could have made it down. And uh, he saw a mist on the a bluff that he really didn't realize what it was until it started moving down the hill. Then he realized that it was the 300 cavalry from Camp Douglas, Utah. They'd arrived and they were led by a Mormon scout, Porter Rockwell. A lot of people don't know that, but he he led them there for five dollars that day to show them the Shoshone encampment. And so Sagwitch woke everyone up, told them to remain brave and calm. And you know he'd had run-ins with the uh, army in the past. He'd always been able to parlay or negotiate a peaceful settlement, but that was never in uh, in the mind of Connor that day. Before he left Salt Lake, he, he did an interview that said uh, he was not going to deprive his man a little fun of Indian killing. And so uh, negotiation was never upon him or his men's mind. They came down to the river, began to ford the river, and then they began to fire upon the, the Shoshones, my people. And, uh, but what's, a, what's an arrow compared to the rifle and sidearms of the soldiers? My grandmother would sit there on the bluff and she would tell me that uh, our people were being slaughtered like rabbits. And uh, she said no butcher could have murdered any better than Connor that day. And she said that she made it so real to me. She described the white snow would, was becoming brilliant red with blood. And the willows that were being used as hiding places were bent down as if in defeat. And we have many stories of survival. Uh, one of them was a woman named Angie Chi. Angie Chi was a brand new mother who had a newborn baby and she told of running to the river to try to jump into this river to escape. And you might ask yourselves, how could you escape jumping into the Bear River in January when it's below zero anyway? And she knew where the hot springs were located and she jumped into the river and swam under an overhanging bank that happened to be there. And when she did, she found herself there with 10 other women. And uh, 
Angie Chi lived to be more than 100 years old, and she told this story to the young children at the Washaki community. Years later, she told of sitting there with her newborn and the, the other women, and they could hear the soldiers on the bank just above their head wondering where they'd gone. And then uh, Angie Chi would tell the story about her baby starting to cry. And then she would end the story with telling those young children that she had to drown her baby so it wouldn't give up the location of the other people while she tried to tend to the seven bullet wounds that she had to her body. And so these are the stories that I, that I grew up hearing sitting on this overlook, sitting on the overlook that overlooked the killing field and the, the hot spring and, and trying to really come to terms as a young child of what she was trying to tell me what it really meant to me. And I'm sure as a younger boy, I really had no idea, you know, the magnitude and, and the loss that she'd, you know, experienced uh, because of this, because of that massacre, I believe, and, and with her education, she wanted to tell this story in her words and in her way. And she always wanted to write this book uh, the book about the Bear River Massacre. So, you know, she, she lived to be 88 years old, but towards those last few years, she got Parkinson's disease, which really crippled her, her ability to do this. And so she uh, passed away without ever writing that book. And so, you know, as I got older and I, I really, I went to the site and I would take my children to the site and we would sit in the same spot. And I would tell them the same stories that she would relate to me uh, about the massacre in the same area with the same words. Uh, it's important that as we tell stories, these oral histories and stories, that you tell it exactly the same way every time. There can't be a word out of place because in oral history and oral tradition, uh, words matter and, and how you tell that story matters. Uh, and so, it was kind of left to me uh, just to write that book. And, and the reason I wrote that book was because of her. And in fact, the whole Bear River chapter, massacre chapter is her words, uh, word for word, the way I'd heard it uh, all those years ago. And, you know, it's funny, Greg, I talked to you the other day about this. Uh, when I wrote this book, I was so excited and happy and you know, it's not a large historical manuscript. It doesn't read like a normal history book does. And uh, I presented it at a school in Idaho, and I won't tell you where, but uh, afterwards, a, a professor came up to me and she said to me, she said, well, did you use primary sources in your book? And, and you know what, those of you who know me know I'm a gentle soul and I, I very rarely get angry or show any emotion, but my head about exploded when I heard her say that and I knew what she was getting at right. and, and I thought, and, and then I just answered her simply and said, yes, I did. I, my grandmother, May Timbimbu Perry was my primary source. And so, um, you know, it really made me contemplate uh, the history yeah. and, and how sometimes Western history and, and colonization has conditioned us in a certain way to uh, accept only those things that have been written down and, and, and primary sourcing. And so that was never the way I learned and it's never the way our people taught our children. And so, uh, and that resonates, I think, with the group you're taught, you're speaking to today, because oral history is again one of our principal methods as public historians, and and honoring the stories of communities that we work with is is one of our our principal goals. And I think it's also though important to point out how your grandmother did influence the writing of history about Bear River. Just quickly before we move on, we mentioned Brigham Madsen. And over the course of his long life and career, he changed his interpretation of the massacre. Um, and in his book that he published in the mid 1980s, he of course included um, your grandmother's account, Massacre at Boa Agoy, in 
as word for word in, as an appendix in, um, in his book. But maybe let's talk about survival. Just before we go into the memorialization, you, you, you shared some really neat pictures that I have never seen before. This is a new one. And then one with, of, of Sagwich's three surviving children who survived the massacre. Could you talk a little bit about this one? Yeah, this picture, uh, I discovered it about two weeks ago. I mean, I have, my grandmother uh, had a collection. She collected everything. I'll bet I have a thousand old photos, Native American photos that uh, on a thumb drive that she has saved and we digitized. And so I know every picture that ever she ever had. And, uh, but this picture was discovered in the LDS archives at the LDS History Library. And so, and I think it's on the University of Utah's collection now and it's available to look at, but one of the historians at the church library uh, called me and said, I am gonna send you a picture and I want you to tell me who you think it is. And uh, she had no idea who it was. She thought she knew. And I took one look at it and said, well, that's Sackwich. And, and not only that, his wife is there on his right hand, uh, left in the photo. She's the woman sitting there, but that's the, the woman who was in the other photo of those two sitting there. That's Biwochi. Biwochi was Bear Hunter's widow. Bear Hunter was one of the chiefs that was captured at, at Bear River and uh, shot, whipped, kicked, tortured in many ways. And that old chief wouldn't die or cry out for mercy. And so one of the soldiers took that uh, hot bayonet and heated it till it was glowing red in the fire. And then they ran that piece of metal through Bear Hunter's head from ear to ear. And Sagwich's wife died that day too. And so Biwichi ended up marrying Sagwich. And I'm looking at these kids and I'm thinking for the first time, you know, I just discovered this picture. This is Sagwich and Biwichi and they're a mixed family of those who, who survived. And, and I, I look at the kids' faces and I, I don't know who they are. Uh, We'll see a picture in a minute of, of three of the kids that we know survived, but you know, I look at those faces today and I don't think any of those are there that day. But uh, this picture was probably taken in around 1875. And the reason I think that is because uh, you know, they got married and, and he was his fifth wife and he took on this family, but uh, Sagwich ended up joining the LDS church in 1873, him and all the survivors. And Sagwich and Biwochi were actually sealed in the endowment house in Salt Lake City by a man named Wilford Woodruff. So I, I, you know, he was in Salt Lake all the time around that period. And so that would have had to have been taken around that time frame in Salt Lake City with all of the children. Yeah. And uh, what a gem of a find that is. And now I'm eager to see what else I can find down at the church history library that may be cataloged that we, I just don't know. But what a beautiful picture that is to me yeah. of, uh, of the old chief that we very rarely have had a picture of before. Uh, the other photo you mentioned. Yes. The three here are three of Sagwich's children. They're all survived the Bear River Massacre that, that went on to live long lives that we know about. So the picture, as you look at the screen on the far right would be Jaeger. Uh, his name during the massacre was Dabuzi, which means cotton tail rabbit. Dabuzi, once he joined the LDS church at about the age of 22, he changed his name to Jaeger, Timbimbu. And so he was a survivor. That middle picture is a woman named Jane Hull. Uh, she was an infant daughter of Sagwich, and on the, the day of the massacre, as Sagwich went back and found his uh, lodge, it was the only lodge that they didn't burn to the ground. All other 70 lodges were burned to the ground except his. He went inside and he found his wife had been killed, but next to her was a brand new in, infant daughter named, well, is this girl right here. She... Uh, he told those that were with her to take her and put her on a cradleboard and hang her in a nearby tree. 
and, and that may seem like it's a harsh thing to do, but he knew without nourishment from its mother that uh, she was going to die anyway. And he had no way of feeding that girl uh, being so infant new. And so uh, those that were with the chief uh, put that girl in that cradle board and put her in a tree. The next morning, a, a pioneer from Franklin, Idaho, the closest community to the massacre site named William Hull uh, found her. He'd been sent there by Brigham Young to uh, see if there were any survivors and count the number that had been killed. And so William Hull, after he had counted everyone, he was making his way back to his sleigh. He, he went over to a tree and he found this young girl uh, in a cradle board hanging in the tree. And he took her home, raised her to adulthood, and uh, she lived a nice long life and had many children. And she went by the name of Jane Hull. And uh, she got married to a Mr. Riley in, in Ogden, Utah. And so she's buried actually in the Ho Hooper City Cemetery in Weaver, Can in Weaver County. And uh, she lived in Utah. It, it's spelled like Hooper, but Hooper, but it's Hooper if you're local. <laughs> and then on the far left is a, he's, he's an interesting guy. His name is, uh, it was Bishop. Now Bishop means red clay in Shoshone. Bishop was about four years old uh, during the massacre. He was found wandering the, the killing field after the troops had left clutching a bowl of pine nut gravy. Uh, he also had eight bullet wounds to his body. If you can imagine a little four-year-old having eight bullet wounds to his body. And uh, he survived. He lived, uh, you know, Sagwich had him as a, a six-year-old. The story goes, and, and I'll let you decide for yourselves, but the, the way our oral story goes, and, and we, my grandmother wrote it down is, uh, Sagwich was here in the Cache Valley in Logan area with Bishop and he left him with an uncle because uh, Sagwich had to go to Brigham City and meet with a man named David Reese. Uh, he told his uncle to watch Bishop until he got back the next day. When he returned, his uncle had sold Bishop to a local family here in town, uh, the Warner family, and he he said, well, I got a good deal for him. I got a sack of beans and a, a sack of flour. And so uh, Sagwich uh, initially was pretty upset uh, with his brother, but came to really realize that Bishop was probably better off uh, with the Pioneer family. I think he come to realize that he was probably going to get a little better life than he could have provided him. See, Sagwich's life was still upside down. Still, he'd witnessed the entire destruction of his people and still was wondering uh, how I'm going to navigate this world I live in now, two different worlds and two different lifestyles. And so a bishop became Frank Timbimboo Warner. And uh, he was the first, uh, he got educated. He was the first Shoshone school teacher. He taught here in Logan in the local school district. He went on three separate LDS missions. And my grandmother said he was the most famous to our people because he was the first one to own a car. And so uh, he would take the Indians, uh, Shoshone Indian uh, kids for rides up and down Main Street in Logan all day long on a Saturday uh, so they could ride in his car. But those three are all Sagwich's children. And, you know, I. What fascinates me is, as I look at the two boys and I, I can see Native Americans written all over it. And I look at uh, Jane and she was raised from an infant by a pioneer family from Franklin. And, and I just don't see, you know, those are her brothers. And I, I just don't see, you know, I don't know if, if being raised in that family. I, it just puzzles me that she would look the way she does, because if you were to show me that picture by itself, I wouldn't necessarily scream that's a Native American woman. 
but she was raised as a, a Mormon pioneer. And, and that's the way she died, not knowing that much about her history. Uh, not much was shared with her during her lifetime about where she came come from. And so, uh, yeah, I mean, this know, is those, really, you know, it illustrates the legacy of, of Bear River, but also survival and persistence. And so let's turn towards the, the commemoration or the memorialization of the event and how that has changed over the years. And this is where we get back to that struggle. And I think the important work that generations of Shoshones have done, including your grandmother and including you, know, you today. And I'll go through these slides and we'll come, we can toggle back and forth through them. But what you're looking at here is, is the first, um, monument put up. This was erected in 1932 by Franklin County, the community in Franklin County. Um, the initial plaque, you see a second plaque that was put up here, but the initial plaque put up in 1932 was um, dedicated by the Franklin County chapter of the Daughters of Utah Pioneers, um, the Cache Valley Council of the Boy Scouts, and the Utah Pioneer Trails and Landmark Association. And yes, for some folks, it's kind of confusing that while this site is in Idaho, in Southern Idaho, it is in the Cache Valley and it is, it's really part of, of Utah culturally, historically because of the, this, the settlement patterns and, and LDS and, and Mormon history. But what you see here in the 1953 plaque is that again, the native people are, are presented as the villains, right? They are attacking peaceful inhabitants. And the Daughters of the Utah Pioneer in this second plaque, really it's not about the event itself or the loss of life there, but the heroic role of the pioneer women in caring for, um, caring for um, the wounded soldiers that day. Um, this is a pretty amazing photo that Darren just shared with me, which I had never, um, seen before and maybe talk a little bit about this one. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one thing my grandmother did besides saving all these pictures, she wrote down what year it was on the front. And, and I'm thinking now, well, why didn't you write it on the back at least? Because I have so <laughs> many pictures that she has now with these you know, big writings of what year they were taken. But this picture right here just says so many things to me. And uh, this was taken in 1932. It's a stage that's set up in front of the unveiling of this rock DUP monument. So, you know, the, this was a celebrated event. I mean, there were church leaders, uh, po politicians, the local communities, everybody came together to, to unveil this, this wonderful monument that was erected by the Daughters of Utah Pioneers to commemorate what had happened at Bear River that day. And so, you know, many of our tribal members came, they dressed up in regalia. They're there sitting on the stage in front. Uh, you know, some of them, I think this is pre, before they took the sheet off because, mm -hmm. you know, they, they look okay and happy. I can't imagine uh, that they would look the same after they read the plaque. But, you know, one person that was there that day that we don't see is uh, a little girl that was 13 years old, and her name was Mae Timbimboo. And I want to, I know for a fact that on that day in 1932, that 13-year-old girl became an activist. I'm sure when they took that, unveiled that, that plaque for the first time, and she had a chance to read the horrific things that were written on there from the 1932 plaque first. Yeah. Uh, I, I think that day she said, no, this is not acceptable. And I'm going to work the rest of my life to get this story right. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yeah, this picture just speaks volumes to me about perspective, about resiliency about how people uh, were taken advantage of 
uh, you know, my grandmother was invited to speak many times uh, by local people and, and, and the state of Idaho. I just found a letter from the state of Idaho asking her to seek, speak at the bicentennial and uh, she wouldn't do it. And, uh, but she sent a written message in, instead and she just wasn't going to be used anymore to, to propagate this narrative that that's not true. And so uh, she'd spent her whole life trying to get it right. And I believe it started that day when that picture was taken. And, and you mentioned earlier, you know, the 1932 plaque. Yeah. You know, that, so this image that you're showing here is, is an image that's in the Preston Library. That's oh, a picture, yeah, the post office downtown. Post office, yes, yeah, sorry, not the library, the post office. It's still there today. It is. In fact, if, if you go there, there's a handout. <laughs> there's so many people that go see this, this mural that they, they finally put a handout of the, the guy that painted it and gives some background as to why. His and name so, is easy to remember because his name is Edmund Fitzgerald, but he's no relation to the ship that sank and Gordon Lightfoot <laughs> sang about. But this mural was painted in 1941 as part of a project where um, art was, was put into post offices around the country, sort of the last echoes of, of the New Deal. And Fitzgerald also did one in Washington State, which I don't have a picture of. But again, this is how a lot of people would, would have seen this. I mean, imagine the residents of Preston um, who just walked in there on a daily basis. And again, it, it perpetuates this idea of a battle rather than a massacre. You don't see any women and children there. No. And even if they were there, you know, one thing to point out about that ninth, the original 1932 plaque is they're called combatant women and children. Yes. Right. So they are, it frames them as, again, as, as, combatants in a battle, not as, as victims of this, you know, massacre. And the story you told, of course, you know, shines a very different light on it. Yeah, there's not much accuracy in this picture. Uh, I'm looking at them in loincloths and bare skin and it's below zero. And uh, I'm pretty sure that they would have been dressed <laughs> warmly and, and it wasn't anything like that. And so, yeah, that's just one aspect of, of uh, telling a story that just, it, it, it's not true and it doesn't resonate and it never was true, but that's how we remember things. And so, you know, uh, monuments are not history. I want people to remember that. And, and everybody here today, you know that, but monuments aren't history. And so, uh, you know, I look at that monument today and I look at that first plaque that 1932 plaque that just kind of tells, generically speaking, 300 California volunteers attacked a group of hostile Indians and talks about the women and 90 women and children combatants. And it gives the black and white 250 Shoshone were killed, 18 uh, soldiers, uh, four officers, and then later seven others died. And, you know, it kind of tells it in that kind of way. And so not to be outdone, you know, that the first plaque you showed, that was the 1953 plaque. Uh, the Daughters of Utah Pioneers just thought, you know what, we, that other plaque is not historically accurate. And, you know, you may wonder, because I've mentioned time and again that we believe more than 400 Shoshones were killed that day. And you may wonder the discrepancy because in Connor's report, uh, he, he counts two, approximately 250. We believe, and, and we saw in one of his journals that he only counted the bucks. And, and he didn't even have the, he didn't call them man, he called them bucks. And, in his official and his, report, he says he counted 224, but stopped. He stopped counting at 224. Yeah. So that's what went into the official record to the US Army. Well, it wouldn't have reflected very well on him to count the women and children. And, and, and most of them would have been women and children, uh, frankly. And so, you know, we get the 
north of 400 number because we know how many lodges were there. And, and the William Hull had two men with him that day that counted the dead. And they all counted more than 450 in every one of their countings. Uh, they counted more than 450. So uh, is it 300? Is it 400? Uh, we believe it's north of 400. Uh, but, you know, monuments are a funny thing, Greg. They're, you know, monuments are like a window uh, that has been carefully placed to exclude a whole quadrant of a beautiful landscape. You know, monuments only let you see what they want you to see. And so when you, when you create a monument like this with these plaques, uh, you only give uh, the person that comes there to see a, a brief glimpse into the only thing that you want them to know. And, and I hope, you know, I hope people that go there and read that, I hope they're smart enough to realize that, is this really the story? Is that the, is this all of it? because you'll come away knowing that it's not. And so uh, and here's a- I think we know that it's not because really the hard work that tribal members have done. This is a picture I took in 2016 with, with Patty Timbubla Madsen speaking. And just, you can see the growth in the commemoration that the tribe has done every year. Um, for I'm not sure what, you have to tell us what year it started. This was 2016 and then um, this was 2020 and there you are speaking. What people don't see here in 2020 is that was the first year that the Preston School District actually brought out the middle school. And there's a couple, there's a hundred or so kids. And with this, this crowd goes all the way out to the highway, but it also, there's, you know, a hundred or more kids who were bussed out there for the first time to attend this. And I think it's a testament to your work and to other um, Shoshone people's work to bring attention to this and to shift this interpretation. Yeah, and, and you know, when my grandmother told me that no one has ever wanted to hear our story, one day you will have to make them listen. Uh, as I've been engaged with this work over the last few years, it's become really apparent to me that people want to listen now. and and they want to know the truth and whatever that truth is. And, and, and look, I'm not one to, to ram this, our story down your throat. My grandmother was always really quick to tell me that uh, everyone has a story worthy of being told. And she says, what is your story going to be? Because your story is equally as important as mine. And so I, th I think that's the takeaway for me is, is look, our story is important. And it's a story that's never been told before, but our story isn't more important than anyone else's. And I think as, as communities can come together and share their history and share their story and share their perspectives, that, that we're a better community going forward. We're better able to accept those with differences and see each other through each other's eyes. And so it's just vitally important to me that look, it, even if you don't believe our story and, and you think we're out there in some way, uh, it's just important that we were able to share that story. So the more perspectives that you have, the, the better off we are all able to make good decisions going forward and the better able we're uh, able to get to the truth and the truth of what happened on that day. And so, you know, the, our perspective is important in this work. Uh, it's important to, uh, for reconciliation and healing to take place. And so, you know, we're just honored to be able to be a part of that. And I might show this is a, here's a picture that you took just this year that shows how one of those plaques has been replaced by a new plaque that recognizes the Shoshone story and the reality, the truth of what happened there that day. Yeah, and, and you know, the, the funny thing is that, that previous picture you showed of all those people, and I think in 2020, they estimated about 500 people there. Mm -hmm. And so, 
But one thing that would come out of that is people would read that plaque that was erected in 1930, 1953 by the Daughters of Utah Pioneers. And, and the, what would happen is they would go home just angry and they would call the national chapter of the Daughters of Utah Pioneers and tell them that is a horrific plaque. Uh, you need to take it down. And so there's been this external pressure on the DUP to change things. And they started calling me a year ago to say, you know, we're really looking at making a change on that plaque. And I said, well, you know, if you're going to take a plaque down, uh, I would take the one that was erected in 1932 that talks about the women and children combatants. Mm -hmm. I said, I said, actually, you know, on the one side, it's that monument has four sides and there's one side that's blank. My original suggestion would be to just put up a new plaque on one of those empty spaces because I, I'm not sure about you and, and we're all different in this regard, but I'm not a uh, monument eraser. I, I don't, I think historical perspective is important and it's important to me to be able to uh, look back, uh, even if it's a brief snapshot of people's thinking in 150 years ago, where we were 69 years ago and where we are today. And I think if you were to left all three plaques and, and put this one up, it would give you a complete picture of, wow, that was the perspective in, you know, 19, you know, in, in those early years and how that perspective has changed over time, hopefully for the better. Uh, hopefully as we gain more knowledge and information about an event, we become smarter and we make better decisions and we can then talk about those things that uh, share a more accurate description of the things that took place. But they, they ended up taking the, the 1932 plaque down and, and putting up this one. And they ran the, the narration by me before they did that. And I was okay with it. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first sentence, you know, pretty much explains most of what I would want them to know anyway. And so the rest of it is all DUP jargon. And so uh, bless their hearts, that's okay. But uh, as long as that first sentence is in there, that first paragraph kind of says it all for me. And so, you know, they're really trying to do the right thing and get it right. And, and, and as long as we're progressing and learning and trying to be better, uh, I think we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, and let's turn towards, um, here's a picture I took a couple of years ago. Um, with a any group of NEH um, school teachers from across the country and um, who came to Salt Lake City. And one of the days we spent um, visiting the, the massacre site with, with Darren. But let's talk about, I mean, the, the really, I think important news here is that um, the Northwest Band of the Shoshone Nation has essentially purchased the massacre site, which was for, for a, more than a century farmlands and is now working to create a, an interpretive center there at the site. And could you tell us about that, those efforts and you know, where things stand today and how we, you know, how we get to that point of, um, if not reconciliation, at least it's this understanding and, and what it means um, to the tribe to tell the story, but not let the story define them. Sure. Yeah. And that's my story. If you know anybody that knows me knows that's my story. Uh, you know, hard things happen to people all the time. And how we respond to those terrible events in our life will determine our character and who we become. So, you know, I'm, I'm giving you the last answer first, but uh, the Bear River Massacre doesn't define us as a people today. Only the hard work and perseverance and uh, of our people and the resiliency of our people that should define us today and but I hope we can learn from the past and so you know in 2018 uh, we were able to raise two million dollars and we purchased all of the Bear River Massacre site now more than 700 acres and so you're talking about a group of people that were was not moved to a reservation 
we were uh, giving a farm, given a farming community outside of Tremont, Utah, about a thousand acres. And the, the pioneers, the LDS church taught us to farm. They assimilated us into their culture after our joining their church. And so because of that, we were not moved to a reservation. We didn't have a land base. And in 2018, we were able to purchase all of that sacred ground. Nobody was buried there on that day. It was January in the Cache Valley. It was frozen ground. And those bones lie just beneath the surface today. So after that purchase, though, it was important to me. I think a lot of our tribal members were just happy to own the land now. And but it was more important to me that we not only own the land, but we're able to share our history and our stories with the world. I felt that those people that died that day, their stories needed to be told. And so I started a capital campaign um, right after the 2018 to build a beautiful interpretive center on the site. It's not a visitor center with just things in it. It's going to be a place of learning, a place of healing, a place of restoration of all things, not only our tribal histories, but the we're working with Utah State right now to restore the land to what it would have looked like in 1863 with indigenous plants that were used as food and medicine. And so there's a, all this restoration work that's being done uh, on the site today because restoration allows us to heal. And healing is, is at the end of the day our primary goal. This picture up in the right, as you see the cattle down there grazing, you can see the hot spring right in the middle and the Bear River where almost all the people that jumped into the river that day jumped in right there. But that's the killing field and that's where most of the bodies still lie to this day. It's a sacred burial spot for our people. And so where I stood and took this picture is where that building will be. So when you walk out that building on that plaza, that will be your view of that beautiful uh, massacre site. And so uh, I've been, before COVID hit, I was really successful in raising money. I raised more than half of the $6 million. I raised three that first year and COVID hit and kind of brought things to a screeching halt. But I, I'm happy to say that things are progressing forward again. And hopefully by midsummer, I will be able to say that we've raised all the money. We can start construction on this uh, beautiful building that's going to allow us to share the history of our people. And so, okay, yeah, I, it's just. I thank you. We're at the, the seven o'clock hour, five o'clock hour here in the mountain time zones. It's a little bit earlier, but we have about 25 minutes or so left for questions and answers. So maybe I thought we would turn over, I'm going to stop the screen share and then go to um, Q&A if you would like to, um, I'm looking at what we've got in panels here. Megan Van Frank from Utah Humanity says, um, please share the link to the Boagoy Cultural Center project in case folks want to support it. So that's in the, the chat there and we can certainly post that. Um, later as well. So are there other, do, do folks have other questions? Don't be shy. Let me see, we have about 84 folks participating. So um, there might be some also in the um, feed loop. Let me see if, I can go over there and check. Let's see. Sarah asks, what are your thoughts on telling these stories honestly while also dealing with ancestral trauma? That's a great question. Uh, You know, mass genocide and and the things forced removal uh, really bring about cultural disruption and 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 all of those terrible things. 
being able though to tell the story, being able to have a seat at the table, being able to have these stories, uh, be able to talk about it uh, is really healing. That's where, that's where the reconciliation comes through. And that's how we begin to heal as a people. And so uh, being able to talk about it. One thing we've really worked hard on is, is I was the last generation to really learn from a grandmother the way she'd learned and that their grandparents had learned. Uh, that's lost today in our culture, in our culture. I'm not saying it's lost in a lot of tribal cultures that live together on reservations, but in our culture, I was one of the last ones to go through that process. One of the problems I had as a, as a tribal leader is, is our elders experiencing trauma in their life because they're storytellers. They pass on the, the knowledge to the children tradition, culture, and they've not been able to do that because our kids, for the most part, want their iPhones and they want to stick their nose in the games and everything else. And so one thing we did with Utah State University also, we uh, I ended up writing a grant with a, a wonderful professor here in the technology department that was funded by the National Science Foundation uh, to allow us to use technology with our children to interview tribal elders, to tell these stories that these elders have in their minds and hearts. And so one of the great things that have come out of that is we've re-engaged our children to want to hear the stories. And, and part of this was, you know, if they want to participate, they get a laptop, they get a, play, a way to video these elders and interview elders. We're giving them uh, enough tools to be able to educate to interview them in a right the right way, but it's giving these elders a sense of purpose again, to be able to tell stories that are in their minds that are going to die with them if we don't get them out. And so, you know, allowing that interaction to take place, allowing us to talk about things, allowing us to share our experiences will allow us now to be able to heal from that intergenerational trauma that's that's really prevalent in not only my my tribe but in many tribes across the U.S. today. And you kind of, Darren, you kind of tackled Karina's question as well about the ways in which the community is teaching its youth about um, the massacre. Yeah, uh, and you know, we tried to do. You know, we we've always done classroom and educational opportunities for the children every Saturday at the tribal office. Those have always been ongoing with Rios and Patty, but they're hit and miss on attendance and the ch children. And so, you know, I, I sat in that uh, a conference with this professor in technology and I said, how can we engage our tribal youth now that really know how to use technology in, in a way that I, I never knew. And so we we started using technology in a way that will allow them to do all these uh, oral interviews. And these interviews are going to be available on QR codes at the Bear River Massacre site itself, at the Interpretive Center. You're so, anticipating the questions because Megan Anderson just asked <laughs> how will oral tradition be incorporated into the Boa Ogoy culture? Yeah. Center. That's exactly how we're going to do it. We're using technology and QR codes. And so it's our children that will be uh, fostering these, uh, this dialogue between them and elders. And, and we've been doing this a year now, compiling all of these stories. And we're using a group in uh, Salt Lake called Spy Hop that actually is a nonprofit. They do great work, but they teach these kids to be storytellers through technology. And so we've really engaged bright minds uh, outside of the tribal circle that, that know how to use this and, and can really shape what we're doing going forward. And so I'll tell you that our kids are engaged now. We get more and more every day signed up to, to want to, to tackle this stuff. And now our elders have a sense of purpose again. And it's really something that's really blossomed into something amazing because of it. Yeah. Um, JID asked, 
does the Preston Post Office mural handout accurately interpret what really happened that day versus what is portrayed in the mural? And I don't know the handout, I don't have a handout here. I do know that the Smithsonian Institution's National Postal Museum has a page devoted to that mural that does mm -hmm. deal with both of those. Obviously it is an art museum, so it, it does focus on the actual, the painting itself. But Darren, do you have a take on what the handout at the post office does, I don't remember. Yeah, I've read it a few times and it just is more about the author and the background to it. It doesn't uh, try to, to share any, you know, historical accuracy facts at all. It just pretty much points out mostly where the author came from and what you mentioned earlier about how uh, the government was trying to put these in post offices around the country. And so that's what it mainly speaks to. Um, Farina, King has another question. Um, what would you recommend for the public memory and memorialization of Washakie, which is the community that you mentioned briefly before, and possibilities to reclaim and recognize Shoshone presence and history there? So you might give a little background up on the community of Washakie, because I think most folks, yeah. certainly outside Utah, have never heard of Washakie. Yeah. When we joined that, when the survivors, Sagwich and his people joined the church, 10 years after the massacre, they ended up being baptized in one mass baptism uh, in 1873. And so from that point on, Brigham Young would not let us move to a reservation. He said, instead, we'll, we'll establish a farming community. That farming community was established in 1978 and was there until 1960, actually. My dad was born and raised at Washakie. So it was this Indian community that had been uh, there for a long, long time. The LDS church called missionary families that some of them taught us to farm. Some uh, worked in the schoolhouse. Uh, there was a local ecclesiastical bishopric that was formed, white people at first. And so they were there to serve us and, and really assimilate us into the culture. Uh, we thought we owned the land. So we thought the church had bought that and given it to us. And in uh, reality, they hadn't because in 1960, uh, most of the families had moved away, although there were about 10 that still lived there. Uh, a local LDS bishop went through and burned down all of the homes with many people with more than 10 still living there. Now, some of them were away at Fort Hall and and Wind River, uh, Fort Washakie, visiting relatives when it happened and, and most of them lost everything they had. And so there were some really bitter feelings there. We were recognized as a federal tribe in 1989. So it hasn't been that long ago. One of the, the prerequisites of being recognized as a tribe, you have to be landowners. And so we petitioned the LDS church that, hey, this community of Washakie was ours. There's a graveyard there. Sagwich is buried there with many of our people. And so the church uh, looked at it and they, they gave us 184 acres, which we met, turned into trust land, which because of that allowed us to be federally recognized. That was one of the requirements. It's not all of them, but it was one. But still at that uh, community today. It's owned by the Kingston Polygamous clan today. There's still one of the homes, the old homes is still there. It's on the National Historic Registry. And so the Kingstons couldn't tear it down. The old church house is still there and the old school is still there. And uh, they've both been renovated to what they would have looked like back then. And so I give a lot of tours there. Anybody and, and all of you, if you want to come here, Give me a call and I'll take you personally to the site. We'll go in the school and the church and I'll take you up to the cemetery. We just put a half a million dollars into the cemetery through some grants and reclamation and things to improve the cemetery, to bring water to it. It's on the foothills in the sagebrush and it's an old, old uh, Native American cemetery, but it's beautiful. And so we are uh, trying to reclaim as much of that land back as we can, but some of those old historic buildings are still there. One of the chapters in my books talks about Washakie 
and what that community looked like and the activities that came about. But uh, our people lived there for a long, long time. And uh, we learned to be farmers and ranchers at that community. Yeah. And yeah, I, I'll say as a, as a matter of fact that when Darren says, give him a call, he, he means it. <laughs> he will show up and he spends, I don't know how many days each year speaking to school kids here in Utah. And now, you know, after the NEH grants, I think zooming into, even before COVID, zooming into classrooms in other parts of the country. We had teachers here from New York and Connecticut and Ohio. And, yeah, yeah I, that's my favorite thing. I mean, before COVID shut everything down, I went to 70 elementaries in one year to share. And I take a big tote of uh, my grandmother's dresses and moccasins. And we talk about brain tanning. And uh, it's so important to me to share this knowledge with our youth. Uh, but what I'm finding is our, I've been doing this for so long. Our youth now are young adults and becoming adults themselves who have a very different view on the Bear River Massacre because of the things that I shared with them years ago. And I think that's part of the tide changing of truth telling and, and perspectives changing. So, uh, but I do it out of the love for my people. I don't do it for any other reason. I never charge and, and I do it out of the, because my grandmother did it, my dad did it. And it's important to me that I do it uh, to carry on that legacy. And are there any kids in, in the tribe today who you see sort of maybe inklings or, or spark that they are going to be that next generation? Coach? You know, I, I was worried about that. <laughs> so, but I think, uh, you know, there's, there's a couple of that have kind of risen to the top now. So I, I think we'll be in good hands going forward for the next 20 years anyway. And so, you know, I worry about that though. Oh. And I worry about that there, none of them are my kids. I mean, I had seven. You'd think one of the seven would be able to do that. And now one of them works for the tribe and is very instrumental in our success today. But uh, to me, I, you know, it, it makes me a little sad that I still don't have a storyteller. But uh, they're still young. And you know what? When I was in my mid-20s and young 30s, I probably wasn't that engaged either. And so there's still hope out there. They know who they are. They they know what heritage they come from and they know how important it is. And so, you know, there's still hope on the horizon, I guess. Well, we have a few minutes left. So we do have time for another question or two. We'll see if anything comes in. Um, but boy, we've been on here a while, and I know I can only, I can sit here and talk to you all day. We've done this before um, on bus rides and and so on. So it's um, it's always good um, to sit down and talk with you, Darren. And to it's really exciting to see, you know, how tribal history has been preserved, but how it's being put into play. Oh, we do have a couple of questions here. I was not scrolling down. I should have looked at this. Um, Fred <laughs> McBoss says, what advice would you offer to individuals who work at parks and historic sites and want to share tribal stories with audiences that may be or include people who are resistant to hearing them? So how do you speak to the people who just don't want to hear it? Yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, I wish I knew. I, I was hoping that was going to the way that how do you engage with more tribes to, to allow them to share that knowledge with you. You know, I one thing that's really helped me, and, and it, maybe it's my personality, uh, I think Sagwitch was more wired like I am. I'm wired like Sagwitch was. Uh, look, we, we as Native American people have lived a, a, not a great life historically. Uh, you know, when the government has been trying to kill us, they've been trying to change us and, and take the Indian out of us. And so one thing that I've, I've found that's really been helpful is, is I don't hit people over the head with it. And I don't, I don't have share the attitude that, uh, 
you owe us something and there's reparations that need to be made. Although personally, I think there are some reparations that need to be made, but my, my view and the way I tell the story is, uh, as I said earlier, horrific things happen and, and those are in the past and it's important that we recognize those things from the past, but the story should be us going forward as a group of people together. How can we use those stories to make the world that we all live in a, in a better place? And so however you share that story, as long as we're circling back to those things were, were in the past and it's important that we acknowledge them because we can learn from them. But that's not the point here. The point here is how can we take those stories and move forward to a better place? And that's always where I wanna to get to. How can we take the massacre and, and while we acknowledge it and learn from it, uh, we're still here as a people. And how can we move forward together, me and you together to make our communities and the world that we live in a better place for everyone, where everyone has a voice and everyone is included. And so that's the message. And, and in your walks of life, that should be the message for you too. Uh, we can talk about hard things, but at the end of the day, we need to make sure that message resonates with people of we're working on making our communities better. One more, we have one last question at least, and it's from Rebecca Wingo and she asked, as you collect stories from your community elders, who is processing those collections and how are they differentiating between the stories for the public and the stories that should be kept private? Very important question. That is an important question. And we have a, one thing within our tribe, we have a cultural resource specialist that is Patty, you know, Tim Bimboo Madsen. Uh, I hope she's with us a lot longer. She had COVID, you know, and she really got sick there for a while. And we were really worried about her. Uh, she's an elder. And so uh, we make sure everything runs through her. And then she runs through the tribal council when there's ever anything that really she doesn't uh, have a clear picture on and how she might want to proceed. But you're right, there are things that should be shared. There are things that should not be shared. We signed an agreement with Utah State University uh, last year. We have uh, now digitized all of our tribal records and photographs and all of these histories that we are making available to Utah State University's special collections that will be available online. Now we've, we've given them everything that is shareable. Uh, we've kept back those things that we feel just are, are so sacred and that have to do with ceremonies and other things that we don't share. And so, but that's, that's firmly in the place of uh, our elders who, who uh, have a firm grasp on that uh, responsibility. Well, I think we're, we're getting close to the end here and I don't see any other questions. We've been here a while. So I think maybe that's a good place um, to end. And again, to ex extend my heartfelt thanks to Darren Perry for um, participating in this plenary. I think it is a great way to um, get at the big questions that are raised by our theme for the conference this year on the, the presence and persistence of stories and of course the conference isn't over yet we have a another day of programming tomorrow online and darren's going to be a part of a a session tomorrow as well um, so you might keep an eye out for that and um, a big thank you to all the community members who also joined us and um, we'll see you all i guess um, online i'll leave the last word to darren if you want to so, oh, well, you know, I'm just grateful that you, you've, you've given us a voice. You've allowed us to be able to share a part of history that a lot of people haven't heard before. And it's just one, pers one more perspective you can put in your, your vest and decide for yourselves now that you have more information where that falls in the spectrum of truth. And uh, it's all about truth telling. And, and when you do that, you allow a community to begin to heal. And thank you so much for allowing our community this chance to 
heal even further. This has been a blessing in my life, Greg. So I appreciate you and the, the group for allowing me to share some of these things with you today. All right. Thank you all.